Good morning. My name's Luke, and I have the honor, privilege, and responsibility of sharing with you guys what happens next. Now, for most of you that have been here for a little while, you know we've been working through the first five books of the Bible. There's a special name for that. What is it? Who knows it? A special name, the Pentateuch. That's right. And the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible, and it kind of goes over a lot of the law. It sets the table for what's about to happen, and now we're about to get to a bunch of action. Okay? We got started last week when we learned about Eli and Samuel and his, and his mom that gave him to the, the priesthood, and Samuel becomes the prophet. You know, he's the last judge. He's the guy who anoints the first two kings of Israel. He's a prophet of the Lord. This guy, Samuel, he's a pretty big deal, right? He's pretty awesome. How many people in here know somebody named Samuel? Yeah. In contrast, how many of you know somebody named Saul? How many people know somebody named Saul? You do? You actually know somebody named Saul? That's not a super popular name. Because, biblically, the only two Sauls that are recorded in the Bible didn't end up doing super well. Well, one of them ended up doing well, but he got his name changed to Paul. You'll learn about him in a, in a year or so. Okay, so we're talking about four major people today. Okay, and if you'll remember this, it might be worth something later. First, we're going to talk a bit about Samuel. You learned about him last week. We're going to talk about a guy named Saul. You learned about him last week, right? We're going to learn about a guy named Jonathan, who I believe is going to get introduced to you guys this week. And we're going to learn about a guy named David. Okay? Those are the four main people we're talking about today. Samuel, what was he? He was a priest, right? And a judge. He's not, he's not really operating as judge anymore. Now that there's a king, the judges are kind of done. Okay? So he's a priest. That's Samuel's main role in a prophet. Either one of those I'll take, priest or prophet. This will be worth something if you're paying attention. Samuel, he's a priest or a prophet. Okay? Then we got Saul. What's he? He's a king. King of Israel. Okay? We got David. You're going to learn about him. He's also, in, at this point, he is not going to be king. So David's just a guy. And actually, when you meet him, he's a young guy. Potentially in the 12 to 14 range. Hey, guys. Shh. Okay, so he's, he's pretty young. How many of you in here are 12? We have many 12-year-olds in here? One, two? Yeah. So look, when David gets introduced in the Bible, he's barely older than you guys. 12 to 14 range, somewhere in there, okay? So imagine real quick for a second, Samuel, who y'all learned about last week, shows up and says, hey, by the way, you're going to be president of the United States. Honestly, I'd, I'd be happy with that, Lily. I'm not going to lie. Okay, so... But if he showed up and said, you're going to lead God's people. Oh, okay. And you're just a kid. You're like, uh, I'm still trying to learn the books of the Bible. Read them, it makes us stronger. Right? You're like, ah, I'm not sure if I'm ready for this. All right? So David, he's just a guy, and he's a guy who listens to God. And that's a really important part. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then Jonathan. Jonathan is a prince. Jonathan is the son of Saul. Okay? Jonathan is a guy who is one of my very favorite Bible characters because I think Jonathan handles the situation he was put in with honor, with dignity, with respect, and with fear of the Lord. Well, God's obviously my favorite Bible character, but uh, we expect for him to be great. Uh, not quite, but he's, he's up there. So Jonathan is Saul's son, was the prince. So we'll call him Prince Jonathan, okay? All right. So here's what we're doing. Pick it up in 1 Samuel is the book we're working through. That's going to be important for you to remember. Y'all say that back to me. What book are we talking about today? 1 Samuel. Everybody listening? Hold up one finger. Everybody hold up one finger on your left hand. One finger on your left hand. It's that one. You got it right. Hold up one finger on your left hand. Everybody hold it up high. We're not stopping until everybody's got a finger in the air so I can make sure you're paying attention. Everybody got a finger in the air? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that's, that's everybody. All right. The book we're talking about today is 1 Samuel. Okay? 1 Samuel. You're going to want to know that later. All right. So let's get started because we got some exciting stuff. Y'all remember these pesky old guys called the Philistines? 
Y'all know who they are? Yeah, they're the bad guys. They're terrible. They worshiped gods. They did some awful, awful things. All right? One of the things that made the Philistines so bad is that when things got really bad, the Philistines would sacrifice children. Okay? And they would... That was a really bad thing. It's why God did not like their culture is because they did awful things in the sight of the Lord. And so the Philistines... It says, Saul ruled Israel for 42 years. You're going to want to remember that. Saul ruled Israel for 42 years, and during that whole time that he ruled Israel, the Philistines were a nuisance to Israel. Okay? He fought against the Philistines for the entire, how many years that he ruled? 42 years. That's right. So the Philistines, we're going to pick up the story, and Saul is heading down to fight the Philistines. But the problem is, the Philistines were a much more established community. They had bigger armies, better chariots, they had better everything. What did Israel have? Nothing. Yeah, they had nothing except God. Yeah, which is kind of a big deal. If you're going to go into battle with either chariots or God, history would say you're better off with God. All right? Ask the Egyptians if you, uh, if you ever go snorkeling in the Red Sea. Okay, so... Saul heads down, he's got his army with him, and he has 3,000 people. 3,000, okay? And that's not very many. You think that's a lot of people. Wow, that's a lot. Except when you hear that the Philistines come out to do battle, and they have 3,000 chariots. And on each chariot is two men, and that's just their cavalry. Just the people riding in horses and, and, and chariots. Then on top of that, They have more than 100,000 men. All right? 100,000 to 3,000. Yeah, 106,000, right? Yeah. To 3,000. They're bad outnumbered. Hold on just a second. Yeah. So, what does Saul do? Y'all remember, there's something really important to note as we look over, as we look over the character of Saul for these next eight, or 12 chapters. Saul Remember it said last week that he was, he was a head taller than everybody else, right? That's why he looked like a king. He was a strong guy. Yeah. Saul doesn't ever really just draw his sword and go charging in. He always kind of is a little bit scared. And you'll notice, as we talk about other people, that true leaders lead by example. Saul doesn't hardly ever do that. So Saul goes down to fight. God told him, go whip these Philistines because they need a lesson on who God is. I'm fighting with you. So Saul heads on down there and he sees 100,000 people and he and he stops and he says, okay, I've got a plan on what we're going to do here, guys. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? And he gathers his 3,000 people together. He says, here's what we're going to do. Since God's fighting for us, we're going to hide quickly and as fast as we can get in the caves, get in the fields, hide in the streams. I don't care. Hide or we're going to get our whooped. That's booty, by the way. We're going to get kicked. We're going to get absolutely spanked by these guys. And so what do they do? They scatter. They hide. They go across the Jordan River. They spread out everywhere, and they hide. And this is where you get introduced to a guy named Jonathan. Jonathan's Saul's son. Jonathan, he's looking around. He's like, man, whoo, I don't like hiding when God said go fight. So here's what we're going to do. He calls his armor bearer. All right, it says his armor bearer was a very young man. At that time, he's probably somewhere around 14 to 16. And he says to his armor bearer, armor bearer, here's the thing. God said to go whip these Philistines, so we're going to go whip them. You with me? One guy and his armor bearer. Y'all, an armor bearer is just somebody who carries around your shield and your extra weapons. Because back in the day, you didn't have guns to be able to shoot at people, so you'd take a spear and you'd throw it. Well, once you've thrown a spear, you don't have it anymore, right? And then it's kind of like, uh, I don't have a weapon. And so an armor bearer would carry extra spears, extra swords in case yours broke, because back in the day they didn't have very strong metal. So this guy's carrying around a whole bunch of weapons. He doesn't even really fight all that much, okay? He just helps make sure that the warrior in front of him is ready to go. A little bit like when you guys help us, all right? Some of you help with media. Some of you help as the worship team. Some of you help by being good examples to others. You're helping them learn books of the Bible. You're acting as a type of armor bearer to those of us that are leading, right? You're not up here speaking and giving the message or leading the worship or setting up all the things that Pastor Bob does with the videos and and curriculum, but you're helping. You're making sure that when we need something, you can help us, right? You give us assistance, you answer questions, you pay attention. In a lot of ways, 
you're acting as armor bearers did. Okay? So imagine for a second that me and you, and I say to you, all right, come on, here's what we're going to do. We've got to go preach a really good lesson so that these kids understand who God is. You with me? What do you say? You want to get up here and help me teach? I believe that most of you would, which is the exact answer that Jonathan's armor bearer had. He said, Jonathan, I love you. I'm willing to die with you. Let's go. So they head off. And Jonathan says, here's the thing. Here's what we're going to do. When we get up here to this space, there was a spot where two cliffs came up together, all right? And there was a trail on top of it and a trail below it. And he said, we're going to walk out on the trail below. And the Philistines were camped up on the top. He said, when we get to the bottom, we're going to jump out and show ourselves to those guys up there. We're going to say, yee And if they yell at us and say, wait there, we're coming down to whoop you boys, then we're going to know God's not fighting for us. Let's leave. But if they say, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson, then we'll know God's going to deliver them to our hands and we'll go and fight every one of them. The armor bearer says again, okay, Jonathan, I'm with you. Let's do it. So they go walking down, they're creeping down the path and they see the outpost. They jump out and they thumb their ears and their nose or however they do it. They go, right? The Philistines see them down there and they say, hey, you too. Come on up here and we'll whoop you. What's that's a sign of? God's fighting for them, right? So up they climb, and they climb up this cliff, and when they get up there, Jonathan takes his sword out, and it says he chases them all around this field, an area about the size of an acre. Imagine a spot about as big as the church, the whole building here. It says Jonathan chased them around, and he killed them, and he knocked them down, and when he would knock them down, the armor bearer behind him would kill them. And he fought through these Philistines that said more than 20 people died and everybody else fled. And it says, Jonathan, with the spirit of the Lord on him, won a great victory that day. But then what happened is God didn't stop there because God sometimes, he doesn't use just what makes sense in our brains and what's logical. What he looks for is an act of obedience and then he moves in his power. All right, and that's really important for us to remember for our lives. So what happens is Jonathan goes around whipping these boys. He's whooping them like God told him to, like God told his dad, the king, to that Saul didn't. And he whoops them. He gives them, and he kills several of them, but then the rest of them scatter, and they start spreading fear amongst the armies of the Philistines, 100,000, 106,000 people, right? And they all start getting scared, and they go, oh, man, if one man could do that to our whole outpost up there, imagine what the whole army of the Israelites with the power of their God behind them is going to do, and they start running. Well, Saul hears about it, and he says, all right, it's early morning. Jonathan and his arm bear got up early morning. Saul calls a meeting together of all his guys. He says, here's the thing, guys. Nobody eats a single bite today. Any one of the, of the armies of Israel that eats a single bite, that any food passes his lips, dies. And in this way, we're going we're gonna to go, and we're going to commit ourselves to God, and we're going to beat these Philistines. Remember, this was after the Philistines were already running because Jonathan obeyed God. Saul makes a silly command says, nobody eats anything. Okay? So they start running after him. Everybody comes back from across the Jordan. They hop out of their caves from under the water. Whatever. They probably had like little snorkels or something under the water, you know, in the Jordan River. I don't know. And they go running after the Philistines, and they're, they're beating them and whooping them all the way back to where they came from. Jonathan and his armor bearer, they're still chasing and killing people because they got the Spirit of the Lord on them. Jonathan's running. says, they get into these woods... And all the men of Israel, as they're running into the woods chasing the Philistines, see a huge thing of honey that's just dripping, oozing honey. How many of y'all have ever had, like, like fresh honey? Have y'all, have y'all had honey before? You put it on toast or something? It tastes pretty sweet, right? It's a little bit sticky. Okay, so imagine you're out there doing battle, and you're running, and you're tired, and you're dusty, and your arms are weak, and you see honey just dripping off of a honeycomb. Oh, yeah, exactly, right? So what is, what, but what, what guards honey? Bees. And what do bees do? They sting you when you try to take their honey. So Jonathan, because he's smart, takes his staff, which is like a big stick, and he dips it in the honey up there, and he pulls it back so that way it doesn't get stung, and he licks the honey off of the end of his staff. And it says that his eyes brightened. He was like, yeah, that's good, honey. Okay? And he's, and he's feeling like, yes, this is good. And it says, it says his strength renewed in his body. It renewed in his body. David would later write in the Psalms that God's word is like honey on our lips. This, I imagine, comes from 
him talking about his best friend with his best friend Jonathan and the fact that when Jonathan, who was full of the Holy Spirit, ate honey, it gave him new power. And this is one of the big reasons I want to go over this because Pastor Bob, since he's taken over as in charge of the children's ministry, he has made it a point to make sure that you guys learn the Word of God, the Bible, right? Why? Because the Word of God is sweet like honey, and when we eat it, when we, when we listen, when we consume it, when you guys are doing what you're doing and you learn it, it gives you new strength. It gives you new power to go and fight the enemies of God. Okay? Y'all got that? So this is what Jonathan's doing. He's taking some honey, he eats it, and he heads on into the woods and he goes and he continues whipping people. But what did Saul say? What did Saul say about eating things? Yeah. Nobody eats anything or they die. So now, all of a sudden, Saul calls all his people together and he says, hold on, time out. We ran the Philistines back, but we didn't annihilate them completely. Somebody must have eaten something. What happened? And so they draw lots, which is basically kind of like a, a way of deciding who it was that was guilty. And it comes all the way down to Jonathan. And Saul says, Jonathan, did you eat something today? Remember, Jonathan got up before dawn and went out to fight the Philistines, right? He wasn't there when Saul said the, the, the dumb thing that he said. And Jonathan's like, yeah, I ate some honey. I was running into the woods. I was tired, and there was honey there. God provided it, and I ate it. Saul says, well, you have to die. Jonathan, what kind of dumb rule is this? Saul says, I said it before the battle. We made a vow to God that nobody was going to eat anything, and I told all the people. And so he looks at his army, and he says, army, you got to kill Jonathan. What do you all think his army said? He said, you must be outside your mind. They said, this is the guy who the Holy Spirit came on, the only person here that's actually obeying God, and if you think we're going to raise our hand against him, you are crazy. And so Saul says, well, then let's build an altar, let's make a sacrifice, and hopefully God will forgive us. And so they cruise on. This is Jonathan. Jonathan is a man who listens to what God says, and he does it. Saul is a man who does not. He listens to himself and what he thinks will make himself safe. And that's a big difference. Okay. So next, Samuel, y'all remember him? Old fellow that hears God talking to him in his sleep. Y'all remember him, Samuel, the prophet? Or what's the other thing that Samuel does? Prophet and priest. That's right. Y'all remember him? Well, he's still in the picture. He's over there making sacrifices, whatever, and God speaks to him. And he says, Samuel. That's what God sounds like, I think. Samuel, you got to go tell Saul, I'm still mad at the Amalekites for what they did when we were wandering around in the desert. You got to go whoop them. You got to go punish them. Okay? So Samuel goes and tells Saul. He says, Saul, here's the plan. Come on, gather up. And he says, and he says, uh, come on down. You got to come talk to me. He says, here's what God wants you to do. He wants you to take the army of Israel. He wants you to go down. He wants you to beat, beat up the Amalekites. But here's the thing. You got to wipe them completely out. You got to kill everybody. And you got to kill all their animals too. Because they disobeyed God. They fought against the children of Israel. So they got to be wiped out. You got to move them completely out. You got to kill everybody. Saul says, all right, I'll do it. And so he heads down. He gathers up his, his army. And he goes down against the Amalekites. When he gets there... He sees some people that had actually helped Israel when they were wandering around in the desert. Hey, Gabe, Noah, and Samuel, can you guys, shh, please? Thank you. Okay, and he says, he sees these guys, they're from Kariah, and he says, hey guys, y'all helped us when we were wandering around. Y'all ought to leave the Amalekites because I'm about to come in and kill them. This was an act of kindness from Saul. And so the, the, the Kariahites, as they're called, they leave, and Saul goes in, and, he, and God delivers the Amalekites into his hands, okay? And he delivers a great victory. But what did Samuel tell him to do? How many animals and people were supposed to be left alive? You can just hold up a number. It's like this, zero, zero, leave nothing alive. That's what God wanted. And so Saul and his people decided to leave all the sheep and cows that were nice and fat that would be good for sacrifices alive and they left the king alive. Yeah. Do y'all think that's a good thing? Okay, so when God tells you to do something and he speaks through a prophet, do you think you should do like 98% of it? 100%. That's exactly right. Now listen, here's something that I want to say because this story, it's like, man, God talked Saul really specific instructions 
and he didn't do it. What a bonehead. What a goober. Why would he do that? He's such a idiot. Right? I can't say that word out loud. Okay, he's really dumb. Why would he do that? But listen, here's the thing that I want y'all to recognize. God speaks to you through his prophets as well. Sometimes his prophets sound like your teachers at church. Sometimes his prophets are like your family, your parents. And sometimes the word that the prophets give to you is a word as simple as don't talk during service or clean your room or don't go outside and play until you've done the dishes. And how many people in here, if you're honest, how many people in here have heard words of instruction given to them that were pretty clear instructions and then didn't follow all the way through? How many people in here have ever done that before? I have. That's okay. I'm not asking for examples. I'm just asking who's ever done that, right? The truth is, everybody in here, if you're honest, you've been given instructions and you haven't obeyed them fully. And that's okay. God has grace for that. But let's have a little bit more grace for Saul. Hey, boys, sit still, please. Okay, let's have a little bit more grace for Saul when he didn't obey fully the word of the Lord. But what happens? Samuel goes down there after the victory, and he sees Saul, and he says, Saul, was I unclear in what I told you to do? Saul said, no, I, I heard you. You said to, to wipe out the Amalekites, and I wiped them out. And Samuel said, what's this I hear then? What's the bleeding in my ears and the hee hee of donkeys that I'm hearing? And Saul says, oh, well, we kept some of the animals for a sacrifice, and we kept Agog, which is the name of the king of the Amalekites, we kept Agog alive so that we could, we could show everybody what a great victory we've won. Does that make sense? Samuel says one of the best things that exist in Scripture. He says, Saul, you didn't listen and obey to what the Lord said. And Saul said, well, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to make a sacrifice for God. I figured God would be happy. This is what Samuel says. It's a really important thing. He says, Samuel, uh, Saul, excuse me, he says, Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. I'm going to say that again because this will be important for you to remember. To obey is better than sacrifice. What do you all think that means? <coughs> when God tells you something to do, it's really important to do exactly what he says. Even if you think that somehow you could, you could make a sacrifice that God would be happy with by not obeying fully. So imagine for a second, let me write you a scenario here where this would be applicable for your life. How many of you guys have to do dishes ever at your house? How many have to do dishes? Or any chore? Sweeping the floor, making your bed, cleaning up your room, whatever it is. Pretty much everybody has a chore they have to do at the house, right? Okay. Laundry, dishes, great. All right, so we're going to use dishes for an example. Imagine for a second that, that your parents say to you, um, let's use somebody as an example. I'll use myself. Luke. Luke, you have to go and do the dishes. All right, that means you got to clear the table, wipe the table, clear the counters, wipe the counters, wash the dishes, dry them, and put them away, right? Got to do everything. I know, it's pretty extensive. Okay, and they say, Luke, you got to get the dishes done. I say, no problem. I'll do it. You said a good thing. I know the dishes have to be clean. I like eating off of clean dishes. I'll do it. So I go in there. I clear the table. I put it on the counter. I wipe the table off. I clear the counter, wipe it off. And then I kind of leave. There's a pile of dishes in the sink. And I'm like, ah, you know what? I don't really want to do all of those. Especially like when you get out of the pots and pans. Isn't that the worst to clean? Yeah, that's terrible. Okay. I loaded the dishwasher with the plates and cups and bowls. But the pots and pans I just kind of left in the sink. And I said, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go and I'm going to sweep the floor instead. I don't want to do these. But I'm going to sweep the floor. I'm sure the floor needs to be swept. So I sweep the floor in the kitchen. That's a good thing, right? I've made a sacrifice to my parents. I sacrificed some of my own time, my own energy. I sacrificed for my parents. I said, well, I'm doing a good thing. But what did I not do? I didn't obey, right? So I was sacrificing something that maybe that, maybe my mom hates to sweep the floor. And she'd rather wash those pots. And so I figured, well, I'll make a swap with her, right? But I didn't obey. And Samuel says, and remember Samuel's a prophet, so he's speaking the word of the Lord. The Lord says to obey is better than sacrifice. It doesn't matter what you want to try and give God. God doesn't need what you have. He wants your obedience. And that's still applicable today where we say God doesn't want you to do great works for him. That's not how you become a Christian. 
The way you become a Christian is you obey God's word and you accept him in your heart as your savior. Does that make sense? Same thing was happening back in this day, only Saul didn't understand it. So what does God say to Saul? Samuel's standing there and he says, Saul, because you have not obeyed God, you will no longer, your children will not be kings of Israel. God's going to choose another family. All right. So that kind of ends the first part of this. That's like the first three chapters we're talking about. Now we get to the next part, which is where we're going to talk about David. Remember, David, when he first comes on the scene, is barely older than some of you. God says to Samuel, Samuel, go to Bethlehem. There's a guy named Jesse. Do you all remember last time I was up here, we talked about Ruth and Boaz, right? And their grandson was named Jesse. Same guy. Jesse and his sons... He has seven sons. Nope, I'm sorry, he has eight sons. Seven older than David. David's the very youngest one. How many of you in here have at least eight people in your family, uh, your siblings? I know I do. How many of you? Caroline, you do, right? You got a whole bunch of siblings. Okay, so Samuel goes out there and he says, all right, Jesse, gather up your your sons. I got to anoint one of them as, as king, but I don't know which one. And he sees the oldest son, and he says he's a big guy, and he's very handsome, very strong. He says you could tell he was a good leader. And Samuel says, ah, this must be the guy who's going to be the next king of Israel. God speaks to Samuel and says, Samuel. And he says, that's not going to be the next king. He said, just because he looks nice doesn't mean his heart is right. And I'm looking for someone whose heart is like my own. That's what God said to him. Okay? So... And then God makes a statement to Samuel that's really important. He says, men look at outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And I'm looking for somebody whose heart's like mine. So Jesse brings all seven of his older sons in in front of Samuel. Samuel asks God, is this the one that's going to be the king? God says, nope. Next one. Is this going to be the king? Nope. Next one. Finally, when all the sons are gone, God says no to all seven of them. Samuel looks over at Jesse and he says, Jesse, you got any more sons? I'm sure that's how Samuel talked. And Jesse said, yeah, I got one more, but he's the youngest, and he's out tending the sheep out in the field. Samuel's like, well, get him in here. We're looking for a king. So David comes in, and it says, the Spirit of God was on him when he walked in the door. And Samuel said, bam, we got the next king of Israel. Remember, he's a kid. So he anoints him with the anointing oil, and and he speaks a blessing over him, and he says, from the line of Jesse comes the kings of Israel, And he says, on this, from this bloodline, will be the king that reigns forever. Who do you think he was talking about? Not David. Yeah, Jesus. Remember, Jesus is is referred to sometimes as Jesus, the son of David, because he's a great, 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 great grandson. Okay. So now, all of a sudden, Saul's in a bad mood. He says the Spirit of God left him, and he's all on his own. And he's got this other spirit that comes and torments him. And when he gets in a bad mood, the only thing that gets him out of his bad mood is to hear the sound of a flute being played. So he's like, all right, I'm in a bad mood. That's how Saul sounds when he's in a bad mood. He says, I want somebody that can play me a good flute. Somebody find me a good flute player. And they say, well, hey, one of his guys says, hey, I know a guy who's a pretty good flute player. Y'all want to take a guess at who it is? David. Yeah. Coincidentally, what's that? Oh, sorry, what is it? Oh, okay. So he says, well, what a, what, where is this guy? He says, well, he's down in Bethlehem tending sheep. He says, well, get him up here. Let's have him play the flute for me. You know that often shepherds would play the flute. It also called a lyre, but that's a little bit less. We don't have those anymore. Uh, eh, but they would play it for the sheep to help them calm down. So David's been playing this thing for, for a long time, and God had been preparing him for this task. So he comes up and he plays the flute for Saul when he gets in a bad mood, and it says it calms Saul down. All right? And then we're going to get to a story that probably all of you have heard, for, heard of. This is in chapter, chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. We commonly refer to it as David and Goliath, right? So one day, David's at his house with Jesse. He's wandering around, sweeping the floor, washing the dishes, tending the sheep, whatever he's doing. Jesse says, hey, David, come here. I got a mission for you, my, my boy. And he takes him under his arm. He says, here's the thing. And he slaps his chest. Any of y'all's dads or grandpas ever do that to you? That's how, that's how my grandpa would talk to me. He'd slap me in the chest. <laughs> okay. All right. He says, here's what I need you to do. I need you to head on up to the army where your older brothers are. Take them this cheese and bread, because the Philistines, remember those bad guys, and the Israelites are on either side of a hill 
fighting in the valley. And then he said, go on up there and take him some food. David says, yeah, okay, great. So he heads up there with the bread and cheese, and he goes up to find his brothers. Well, there was this thing happening. On either side of a, of a ravine and kind of a valley, there were two hills, camped on either hill, the Philistines on one side, the Israelites on the other side. And, and every day, they would send down like different people to go and fight down in the bottom. Not the whole armies, but different little individual fights. But the Philistines had this guy, and his name was Goliath. And he stood nine feet tall. Okay? Do y'all see those pieces of drywall on the wall over there? Okay. Do y'all see where the line goes across the middle? That's about nine feet tall. That's how tall Goliath was, the lower one of the two lines. That's how tall Goliath was. Okay? About. So imagine coming in. Y'all look at me real quick. Look at how much shorter I am than this guy. Imagine there was a guy whose head's way up there and I'm going to try and fight this guy. Can you imagine? Yeah. I'd go kick him in the knee. I wouldn't really. I'd probably done like all the rest of the children of Israel. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. This guy that's that tall would grab me by my hair and my belt and just whoop, chunk me across the creek. So, there's this guy named Goliath. Shh, there's a guy named Goliath, and every day he comes down into the valley, and he says, all right, who's going to come fight me? He says, who's going to come? He, he starts calling them the Israelite dogs, and he starts cursing their God, and he curses their army and their land, and he calls them cowards, and he says, none of you can beat me. Nobody can. And he's, here's what he says. He goes down in there, great big tall guy, boom, 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 and he says, here's a deal I'll make with you. I'll fight. You send your best warrior down to fight, just one-on-one. -on -one. Whoever wins, the other army will be slaves to the other, to the winner. Okay? Easy. Not a bunch of people have to die in battle. One-on-one, -on -one, let's fight. What do you think the, the Israelites do? They're all like, uh, who gonna go fight this big tall dude? Eh, they're like, no way. Remind me again, if you remember, who's the tallest guy in Israel? Not David. Who? Saul. He's a head taller than everybody. Remind me again who's the leader of Israel? Saul. He's the king. Remind me again who's supposed to be following God and leading his people into victory? Saul. Y'all want to know what King Saul was doing? <laughs> yeah, he's hiding. He's like, I'm not going to go fight that guy. That's a big old tall dude. He's going to whoop me. Yeah, he's a little bit of a wimpy king. He doesn't have confidence that God's fighting his battles for him. So then along comes this boy. <laughs> he's got cheese. He's got bread. He comes up and he sees his brothers. He's like, hey guys, I brought you some cheese and bread. Who is that? And he points out where there's this big old tall Philistine guy that's yelling curses, calling them dogs. Dogs were, were an unclean animal. So that was a really bad insult to the Israelites. And he's cursing their God, saying that their God has no power. Here's David. He's got like a chunk of cheese in one hand and a loaf of bread in the other and he's just looking down just in shock and he's like who is that unclean what's that yeah a little bit like a mother who is that unclean person that's hurling insults at the army of the living god remember this is like this is a kid he's like maybe 16 17 by this point so who's, who is that? And they're like, dude, shut up. You're a little kid. You have no idea what you're talking about. He's like, I know what I'm talking about and that he's insulting God here. And they're like, David, shut up. You're going to get us all killed and enslaved. And he said, who's going to go fight him? And they're all like, none of us are fighting him. Look at him. He's huge. He's terrifying. He would just boom, pop us apart. We couldn't even, we can't even get close to him. David's like, well, then I'll fight him. And so David, I'm sure he just drops the bread and cheese on the ground. He's like, you'll eat the dirt if you want to. And he heads on down and he says, I'm going to fight this guy. Do y'all think that David considered himself some mighty warrior that he'd be able to get in there and just beat up Goliath? Why do y'all think he wanted to go fight? You just saying. Yeah, he had the spirit of God. He had confidence that God was fighting his battles. He had faith in God. And so he goes to King Saul. King Saul brings him in. He's like, hey, dude, you're the, you're the guy that plays the flute when I get mad, right? Okay, that's cool. Um, uh, you're going to go fight this guy? That's really nice of you. Very brave. I appreciate that. Why do you think you can win? And here's something really important that I want you to remember. 
David says, I'm not some mighty warrior, but while I was tending my father's sheep, the Lord delivered bears and lions into my bare hands. In other words, David killed bears and lions that were trying to kill his sheep with his bare hands. Now, in case you're wondering, normal humans cannot kill bears and lions with their bare hands. Please don't try that at home. The Holy Spirit of God was falling on David and he was grabbing lions, ripping their mouths apart and killing them because he had the Spirit of God on him. Now listen to something really important. If you're not willing to fight bears and lions... Obey the Holy Spirit inside of you and go and fight. I'm not talking about physical bears and lions. I'm talking about the little things in your life that come up. You won't be prepared to fight when the people of God need a champion. Nope, not yet. Okay, so you've got to be willing. When God says to obey him, that he's going to fight for you, you have to be willing to obey that so that when the people of God need a champion, you will have the confidence that David had to say, God's already delivered bears and lions into my hands so I can do this. So here's what happens. Saul puts his armor on David. Remember, Saul's a real tall guy. David's still a young boy, and the armor just hangs on it. And David's like trying to lift the sword, and he can't lift it, trying to move his hands. He's like, Saul, I can't fight like this. He will just squish me. I don't need it. I have the power of God. And so he takes his sling which is just like a rope that you can spin a rock around in the air and sling it over there. It's kind of like a, an old-timey slingshot. And he takes his sling, and he's got his, his bag, and he goes down into the creek, and he grabs five stones. Why do you think he grabbed five? Do you think he was afraid he was going to miss the first time? He's afraid maybe you need to hit him once, hit him twice, three times, four times, five times, and maybe that'd knock him down? You think that's what he was worried about? No? What's that? <coughs> It says that uh, David knew Goliath had four brothers. So he said, I need one rock because it's God fighting for me. But in case his brothers show up, I'm taking the rest of them because I'm going to whoop every one of them. It's God fighting down here, not me. So he puts a rock in his sling and says he runs toward Goliath and he slings that thing. And it hits him, donk, right between the eyes. And it doesn't kill him. It just knocks him out. Boom, and he falls over dead. No, not falls over dead. He falls over unconscious. And David grabs his own sword, Goliath's sword, and no, chops off his head. And he's won a great, a great victory. And then all, that's what the Bible says. And then all the people of Israel, remember they're on two separate hills. They come running down. Whoosh, and the Philistines run and they, they chase him and they kill him. And the people, when they were coming back, they're singing a song. And they sing that Saul has, has killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. And it makes Saul very jealous. He says, I'm the king. I'm the one that's supposed to be getting all the praise here. I don't like that guy. And he gets, and he gets mad at David. That's right. And he gets mad at David. And he gets jealous. And he says, now wait a second. I don't like this David guy. And all the people seem to love him. But I want to be the one in charge, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get David to marry one of my daughters, so that way he doesn't, he doesn't ever want to kill me and my family, uh, because that's how they would do things back then. When another king was going to take over, they would kill all of the old king's family so that none of them tried to come fight him later. He said, well, I'm going to get him to marry one of my daughters. David's a little farmer boy. He's broke. He's not a king's son-in-law. He's like, uh, king, that really wouldn't be good. Besides, back in the day when you went to marry somebody, you had to buy their daughter from him. You had to give him a gift. He's like, I'm poor. I don't have any money. So he said, I can't marry your daughter. But eventually, Saul gets him to marry his daughter, so he becomes his son-in-law. And Jonathan goes and enters into a covenant with David. And he says, we're going to be brothers. I, I submit to you, and I recognize that your family will be kings of Israel for eternity. I just want to follow God, and I will happily be your second in command or whatever you want. Just promise me, David, that you won't kill all of my family. I want to be your friend. And it says Jonathan loved David as much as he loved himself. All right? And now starts the part of Saul's story where he gets awful. You thought he was bad before? No. He's just getting started. Saul gets terrible, and he gets jealous and he starts going after David, and he says, I got to kill him. 
because every time they would go to fight the Philistines, David's army would be victorious because David became a general in Saul's army. David's army would be victorious and all the people of Israel were singing David's praise and they forgot about Saul. So Saul gets jealous and he says, that's it. Jonathan, you got to go kill this guy. Jonathan's like, yeah, I ain't killing him. He's got the favor of the Lord on him. You're crazy. He doesn't say he's crazy, but he thinks it. He says, I'm not killing him. And he goes and he warns David. He says, David, here's the thing. My dad's trying to kill you. And so David runs. And he goes, and, and when he leaves, he doesn't have his weapons. He doesn't have anything with him. He just takes off out into the country. And he comes to this little town, and there's a priest there. And he says to the priest, priest, it's in a place called Nob. He says to the priest of Nob, he says, priest, I'm, I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm, I'm on the move. Could you help me? The priest says, yes, of course, you're David. You're, you're the champion of Israel. Come on in. He feeds him. He gives him food and drink. And, and David says, do you have any weapons here? Because I need a weapon I left without my sword or spear. And he says, I have one sword. Who do you think the sword used to belong to? Goliath. Goliath. Yeah, he says, I got the sword of Goliath here. You want to take that with you? David's like, yep, that'll do. So he grabs Goliath's sword. He thanks the priest, and he heads on. And he goes to a place called Gath, which is in the Philistines' territory. And when they see him, they take him, they're like, hey, this is, uh, this is one, of, one of Saul's guys. So they take him to the king. But David thinks, man, if they think I'm trying to like, come in here and infiltrate, they're going to kill me. So he pretends like he was crazy, like he was mad. And it says he, he drooled so that the slobber ran down onto his beard. So he walks around. Uh, 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 uh. And so the king looks at him and he's like, guys, why'd y'all bring me a madman? It says David stayed there for a few years pretending to be mad okay and then he goes and he joins these people in a little wilderness out in the middle of nowhere and he meets his family there they reunite with his brothers and his dad and his mom and he goes across the Jordan River to the land of, of Edom y'all remember who's who was the guy that the children of Edom came from who's their ancestor he's a famous guy not Samson it starts with the same letter, and he was the brother of somebody famous. Esau. Edom is descendants of Esau, so they're the cousins of the children of Israel. So does Edom. Edom and Esau both start with E. So they go across the river, and they live there among, shh, shh, they, they live there among the children of Edom, and their numbers are kind of growing, and Saul goes, that's it! I don't like these guys! This David guy, I hate him! And so he heads down there with his army. Who do y'all think comes and warns David? Not the Philistines. Jonathan. Jonathan comes and warns David. He says, David, man, my dad's coming after you. He's mad. He, he really, really, really just wants to beat all of you guys up and kill you. He hates you. You ought to run. David said, what have I ever done to your dad? Why does he hate me so much? Jonathan said, I don't know. So they devised this little plan. David's like, surely Saul can't really hate me. <sighs> Jonathan's like, here's what we're going to do, man, because I think he does. He says, you hide in this field. I'm going to go talk to my dad. And I'm going to come back tomorrow with a boy. I'm going to sh shoot arrows like I'm practicing archery. And if you hear me say, go pick up those arrows. And the boy comes and picks up the arrows. And I don't say anything else. Then you know it's safe. Come on back to Israel. And let's, let's be friends again. But if you're out there, if he's out gathering up the, uh, the arrows. And I shoot one way over his head. And I say, ah, it's way out beyond you. It went over your head. Go get it. Run and run fast because it means you know that the king of Israel, Saul, is trying to kill you. So he goes and he talks to his dad. Jonathan does. And again, I love the way that Jonathan always is respectful, but he does what's right in God's eyes. Then he goes and he says, Dad, why are you chasing this guy? And Saul says, Jonathan, you're supposed to be king after me. And David has been anointed king. If we don't kill him, then you're never going to get to be king. And Jonathan's like, if God's not blessed me, I don't want to be king. If God's blessed him, I would rather serve God and, and submit to him and be happy and blessed. I don't care about being a king. And Saul says, get out of my sight, and he insults him. So Jonathan goes out, and he practices archery, shoots a few times. He tells the boy, go get my arrows. And then he takes an arrow, and he goes, Wee-boo! and he sends that thing way out into the field. And the boy's like, where'd it go? He said, it went over your head. And David knows. And so David comes running out, and he falls down on the ground in front of Jonathan, and he cries, he says, because he knows that Jonathan saved his life. And he says, Jonathan, let's recommit to each other the bond that we have to say that we're brothers. 
no matter what your dad tries to do, no matter what, and Jonathan re- recommits to him, and he says, I love you more than I love my own self. And Jonathan was a good friend. He was a very good friend to David. And so David runs back into the wilderness, and Saul goes and chases him. All right? And David ends up, they run. It says at one point, Saul and his army are running down one side of a mountain. There's a big mountain right here, right? Saul and his army are running along one side. David and his army are running the opposite direction along the other side. And just when Saul's about to come around the corner and catch David and his men, the Philistines attack in a village nearby, and Saul's army has to leave and go fight the Philistines. And then David runs to a place called En Gedi, which is where there's lots of streams that run through rocks. It's kind of a a beautiful place. I've actually been there, and there's a bunch of caves there. And so his men go and hide, and while he's there, he's hiding in the back of a cave. Saul and his army come to try and find him, but it's really difficult. It's really rocky, broken terrain. And it says Saul goes into a cave to relieve himself. Y'all know what that means? He went to go poop. Yeah, so he goes into a cave to get some privacy. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that in church, but that's what he was going to do. And he goes in there, and he's, and he's using the bathroom. David is hiding in the back of that cave with a bunch of his men. And so they're looking out. You can imagine they're back here hiding, and they're like, okay. And they look up, and they're like, man, what the, that's the king up here pooping in our cave. All right? And so his guys are like, David, 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 go kill him. Go kill him. You could kill him right now and end this whole thing. You've been anointed king anyway. Go kill him. David's sitting there. He's got his knife out, and he's like, okay. So he sneaks up behind Saul. Saul's just sitting there doing his thing, and he grabs his cloak. You know, they wore big big cape kind of looking things, and he cuts the corner off of his cape, and then he gets to feeling guilty, and he says, this is someone that God has anointed king of Israel. Who am I to kill him? When God doesn't want him to be king, God will take care of him. When God wants me to be king, he'll put me in charge. I'm not taking matters into my own hands. So he gets to feeling guilty and he crawls back over to his guys. He's like, guys, I couldn't do it. That's God's chosen king. I can't kill him. I'm not that guy. And so his guys are like, man, David, you really missed an opportunity. So Saul gets done. He cleans himself up and he goes back out. And as he's going down the mountain, because they can't find David and his men, David comes out holding that corner of the cloth. And he stands up on a rock and he yells down at Saul. He's down there in the valley. He says, Saul, king. Look at what could have just happened. So you came up here hunting me even though I've never done anything wrong to you. You've been trying to kill me for years. And I've done nothing but serve you and help you and play the flute for you when you were feeling bad. Peter, I think your mom's here. And you need to repent. And God says, God, God, the Holy Spirit came on David and he, and he prophesied to Saul and Saul got to feeling guilty and he said, all right, you're right, David. I repent. Come on down. You could have killed me. You didn't. It proves you're a bigger man than me. Come on back. Go to Israel. Come on back to Israel. Stop hiding out in the caves. I was wrong. You were right. Let's get back on with normal life. Okay. A couple of things to note, and we're going to worship a little bit together, is that one, God wants your obedience, not necessarily what kind of works you can do for him. All right? The fact that you may be able to sing beautiful, you may be able to evangelize, you might be able to speak, God wants your obedience. Okay? Make sure you're obeying what God's told you to do. And second, even if your family isn't obeying God, it's really important that you do. All right? Even if your family isn't reading the Bible every day, it's important that you do. Okay? Continue to obey God like Jonathan did. Even if your family isn't always doing right, nobody's family is perfect, okay? My son, we will raise him, and we'll hopefully read him the Bible every day, but I'm not perfect, and, it, and he needs to obey God even when I'm not, okay? So it's two important lessons from today. One, repeat it back to me. Obey. God wants, sacrifice, God wants obedience more than sacrifice, and two, follow God or obey God even when or even if your family isn't, okay? All right, you got that? So we're going to worship a bit together. If y'all will, if you want to come up here and pray, you're more than welcome to, and you can ask God to give you something that you can act in obedience, and then we'll have some trivia challenge afterwards, okay? All right, thank you guys. Getting to